Grace and peace. God bless you. Welcome back to Soteria Prophetic Ministries. And today, um, I'm going to share um, a dream that um, someone dear to me uh, shared with me yesterday. And immediately upon reading it, I felt um, like it was something that I needed to share with the body. Um, I felt like there were some things that was going on that um, we need to be aware of as a corporate body. Um, one of the gifts that God has placed Bless my life with is the ability to interpret dreams. I've taught on um, on dream interpretation. Um, I've been teaching that class since 2009, and um, just blessing God for the ability to help people, help God's people unlock those mysteries and, and um, interpret uh, symbolism that they may be uh, seeing in their dreams. Um, it's important to note that um, there's not a blanket um, application for dream interpretation. In other words, um, <clears throat> for example, the color red uh, can symbolize love, it can symbolize um, sin, it can symbolize the blood of Jesus, it can also symbolize anger. So you don't want to you know, get into the habit of every time you dream someone seeing uh, wearing red or flashing a red something that oh that person is angry. You know, it, could, it just could mean a, a variety of things. Um, you know, the same thing applies to characters, people characters in your dream. It, it just can symbolize so many things. So you don't want to get stuck um, in terms of just, you know, using a blanket approach. Uh, you know, one one interpretation fits all. Uh, that's never the case. You know, that our God is a, um, he's an awesome God. And his ways are past finding out. So number one, we have to understand that interpretation comes from him. Daniel said that. Um, also understand too that um, you know dreams have three sources dreams have three sources it's either God has sent revealed that dream to you either the enemy has planted something in your spirit um, or it can be according to Ecclesiastes a dream um, comes comes through the multitude of business or it can be a pizza in a, in a late night movie dream has nothing to do with anything happening in the kingdom of God has nothing to do with what's happening in your personal life. It's just one of those dreams where your brain, your mind dump trash. I call them garbage dreams where it's just your mind's way of cleaning out or what's the word emptying the cash, right? Uh, you know, on your hard drive, what have you ever so often, especially if you download a lot of, um, files or whatnot, you want to empty the cash, C-A-C-H-E, not C-A-S-H, <laughs> um, you, you want to clear that, free up your memory, right, so the mind, you know, God is so awesome the way he designed us, the mind has a way to clear itself, to, to, to heal itself, and that, that's a whole other topic, um, I have an awesome friend in the Lord Apostle Natalie who teaches a lot about that, um, but yeah, your mind has a way when you take in things during the day, things at work, things when you're stuck in traffic, your mind has a unique way of healing itself by dumping things out of its storage so that you can make room for that which you need to hold on to. Um, so many times you will experience what I call garbage dreams. And that's just, you know, <laughs> and I just say, and, and pardon my folly, but, you know, you were in a dream and you're running downtown, running through downtown New York with a, you know, giant Eminem chasing you, you know, just, just, just something, you know, just to, to help free your mind of the clutter is, it's, it's, it's own, um, uh, way of healing itself, freeing itself. Um, so praise God. I don't want to get too much into that, but anyway, that is a gift that God has given me, um, is to interpret dreams. And, um, I, I bless God for it. Two reasons why. Number one, being able to hear from God. I mean, some dreams are such mysteries that, I mean, it, it sometimes it takes me, I've had people waiting, um, for, I think the longest time has been maybe a few days, maybe a week. I don't know. Um, where I'm just like, you know, I, I say, hey, you know, man of God, woman of God, sis, bro, give me a minute. You know, because there's like some, you know, there's some people, especially prophetic people, especially seers specifically, their dreams can be so vivid um, and so lucid, right? 
And it, it can, by the time you sort through where the colors are and who the people characters are, then the circumstances, it can really take a minute. Um, so, you know, it, everything is not just going to, you know, unveil itself to you overnight. Some things take time, depending on what it is. If you remember, even Daniel, he was asking God uh, for the interpretation of the vision, right? And that was where we get the whole Daniel chapter 3 thing from, where the prince of Persia came and fought against the um, answer, fought against the revelation <clears throat> of Daniel's dream because he did not want Daniel to be aware of what God was revealing to him. And God was dealing with uh, Daniel about things that, you know, way beyond his time. Daniel saw Alexander the Great. Daniel saw Cleopatra. Daniel saw um, airplanes, right? And, and so the wisdom and the revelation that God gave Daniel was so uh, profound. And so before his time, God told him to seal the book because there were things that it was not time for the earth to uh, receive. And I say this to you who are prophets, so those who are prophetic, uh, prophetic people, um, you know, God gives the secrets to his servants to prophets. <clears throat> and you really need to understand it. I think sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, in our overzealousness, you know, and, and God help you if you've got some underlying rejection issues or abandonment, you know, orphan spirits and you just need that attention, you need that validation or you need that applause. Um, it can cause you to run with things that God is showing you prematurely. And even though it was a God thing, yeah, God did show you that, but you moved out of timing. Um, you moved ahead of God and you can cause some undue warfare. Uh, you'll find many times in scripture, Jesus will say, you know, he even told his mom the first miracle, right? The wedding in, in Cana or Cana actually is pronounced, but the first way he said, woman, don't you know, it's not my time yet. So he understood many times and I'm, I'm going here for a reason. Many times we do things and we put our hands to things or we say things before it's time to be released. Always ask God if it's not clear in your spirit. Now, sometimes things are just impressed in your spirit, and especially if you have that experience, you're more seasoned than God, and you understand how God flows with time and, and the ebbs of God and the flows of God, then you know, okay, yeah, this is a rain. I need to drop this right now. But there are other times that, <clears throat> that you need to be cognizant of that uh, it's not time. And even though it was a God word and you release that word ahead of time, it won't have the same effect. It won't, um, it, it won't. It won't uh, uh, produce the same effect that God wanted it to have. In other words, a person's heart has not been conditioned. The atmosphere has not been conditioned. And here you are throwing, <laughs> throwing a word out there and it's not time. So you want to make sure that, um, you know, understand that the gift of prophecy is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's his word. It's not yours. We are just messengers and conduits uh, that God uses to release that word into the earth realm. But it's not your word. Is God's word. He copyrighted that word. He licensed that word. So you must make sure, you know, as a publisher, I always put that disclaimer in, in that clause in the beginning of the copyright pages for my clients. Don't take anything out of this book without getting written permission. <laughs> you know, no, don't copy it. You know, you, you need to get written permission. Same thing applies in the realm of the spirit in terms of the prophetic. Um, you know, make sure that you've been permitted to speak. Otherwise, even though it may, God did truly say, but it's not time. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just kind of want to throw that out there, um, that there are some dreams that God will just say, hey, I'm going to show this to you, but lock it up in your belly. And you got to carry that thing. Um, I think it was like Jeremiah. He just wept and wept and wept and wept because he had to carry. He had to carry that word. Right. And um, let me tell you, one of the most uh, frustrating things. Uh, is to carry something, whether it's a dream or a word, and you've got to labor with that word. You've got to wrestle with that word. Uh, you just have to hold it. You're just pregnant with it, and God won't let you release it because it's not time. So you you have to bear that, okay? That's why many times in the scripture, I wrote a book called The Burden of the Prophet. Um, the ministry, um, oh God, The Burden of the Prophet, the Burden of Prophetic Ministry, thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, it's the burden of it. Burden is something heavy, you know. Um, so anyway, I don't want to get too much in that. But it, the per, being able to interpret dreams is an awesome gift. Um, there are times when I just don't get it. I'm like, God, this is just too wonderful for me. I cannot attain into it. <laughs> and I just tell the person, look, I'm, I, you know, just God is not releasing revelation right now. Just hold on to it. Keep it, you know, in your folder somewhere. Write it out. 
and wait for God to get the interpretation. Um, but with every dream, and this is how, like I said, you've got three sources. God is showing it to you. The enemy is going to show it to you. And if the enemy is going to show something to you, you know, always check. I tell my students, check your check how you feel. When you wake up, do you feel scared? Do you feel intimidated? Do you feel threatened? And then, you know, compare that to the fruit of the spirit. You know, is God going to scare you? Yeah, even though God may alarm you, he's going to give you a remedy. The dream he showed Pharaoh, uh, there was a remedy to that. Right. So when you when you're having dreams and things and, and, and you're not really sure, I mean, you should know the garbage dreams. You should know when, OK, this is just crazy. I, there's no way that, you know. I would do that. So, and just dismiss it. Don't even waste time trying to figure it out. It's, it's just your mind healing itself. So let it go. Um, any dream from the enemy's camp, tear it down, cast it down in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But if God is showing you something, seek interpretation of it and then ask God for permission to release it. If that's the case, sometimes God gives me, listen, many times God gives me dreams about people who are close to me and you know, it's not time. You go to them with that dream and it will all hell will break loose. Because they're not in position to receive it. Oh, you, whatever. You know, I'm not even going to go there. But it's just not time. And so God would just have you to labor um, and travail over that. Okay. Um, so let me share this with you. This dream that a woman of God, she's a prophet, awesome woman of God, shared with me yesterday. Here's what she says. I was on a bus sitting close to the front and the bus driver put the bus on cruise control. And she said the bus was speeding. Um, while it was on the highway, and got up and walked away. So the bus driver got up while the bus was speeding, put the bus on cruise control, got up and walked away. She said it was very scary, but no one seemed bothered by the bus being unattended. I watched as the bus sped and the curves that were on the highway just up ahead. I was afraid for the lives on the bus, so I got up and got behind the wheel of the bus to try and navigate it so that it would not crash. The bus sped up, but there was no crash. Okay. Um, so that was her dream and it just kind of shook her, you know, she was weepy and, and all that. I won't dare release her name, but she's an awesome woman of God and I trust her spirit. So after a little bit, I, this is what I felt that the Lord, and I often say this, this is what I feel like God is saying, because I'm not an authoritative figure on dream interpretation. God is. So I would always say, this is what I feel. And I offer this for your prayerful consideration, Right. Because I can be wrong. And um, so, you know, I said, um, woman of God, I feel the dream is saying, and I said, disclaimer, please note that it may not represent you specifically. It can represent the body of Christ at large. Keep in mind that as a prophet, many times your dreams will be symbolic of groups of people and not necessarily speaking to you as an individual. I said, I believe the bus represents movement in the kingdom. Excuse me. I believe the bus represents movement in the kingdom of God. The bus driver is the leader. You are close to the leader. Please note again that this is not necessarily. Okay, hold on. For you personally. But I believe that as you were close to the leader, you were able to see the momentum of the bus and picked up concern for the speed. For reasons unknown. The leader walked away. That could mean a disinterest, being disgruntled, or abandonment. But for whatever it is, in the midst of the movement of the work of God, the leader abandoned the work. Um, let me see. Because I had to screenshot this. Let me make sure I got it. Okay. Um, because you have a heart for leadership and for the people, your spirit became alarmed. But the others who were riding on the bus, which can represent the membership, had no idea what was going on. Perhaps it was spiritually discerned so that they would not panic and scatter. But you picked up on it. I feel like when you took the driver's seat that you knew instinctively what to do. I feel like the Lord had you prepared to sit directly behind the leader so that you would know where to take off. Lastly, you mentioned that there was no crash. And that is to... Settle your, settle your spirit to know that what God is moving you into, though you may feel anxiety about it, there will be no casualties. And of course, um, she received, uh, the interpretation of the dream. And for that, we give God glory. Um, so I wanted to just use that as my, um, just as a launching pad for my topic for today's podcast, um, that 
there is, and, and like as I shared with her in uh, interpreting her dream, I don't believe it was just for her necessarily. I don't believe it was just necessarily a personal uh, dream. I believe that's something that uh, we're seeing in, in the body. We're seeing leaders um, abandon the sheep, abandon the work. Uh, many of you may be seeing that too. And listen, to abandon something doesn't always mean that they have physically left the building. There can be leaders who have abandoned the work and they're still there every week, you know, but their heart has left the work. Their mind has left the work. Their devotion has left the work for whatever reason. And, you know, I get it as a leader. And I've been pastoring this year will be 15 years. And let me tell you something. It You better be called. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, and I'm serious. You had better be called. I hear people say, you know, God has called me to the work of ministry. And then I, even I, I have three um ministers that I'm licensing by the grace of God this fall. And, you know, I met with them. We have ordination council meetings because I want to make sure I made many mistakes in the past as a leader, um, as a young pastor, um, you know, being so and I'm just being transparent here. OK, I mean, no, hey, you know, I've repented. So I'm, I'm straight. There's no condemnation. I made a mistake and I, and I went to the realm of the spirit and rescinded those licenses. You know what I'm saying? I mean, totally revoked it. Um, but I made a lot of mistakes as a young pastor um, p- looking at people's charisma looking at their charm, even looking at what they've been contributing and, and in that, um, setting them up for positions and leadership. And let me tell you something, God, <laughs> I don't know how many of my podcasts you all have been listening to, but you know, one thing about the Lord that I've learned in my own private personal walk, um, is that he deals with me harshly, you know, he deals with me harshly. And that's why I often tell uh, my sons and daughters in the Lord walk soft, Walk soft before. And when I say walk soft, people say, what does that mean? It means humble yourself. You know, chill out. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You know, chill out and sit down. In other words, it's not about you. And, you know, I've learned that because of the way that God has 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 um, corrected me down through the years. God has he when when God corrects me. And again, this is my personal testimony. It can last for years. You know, I see some people and I'm telling you, I wonder, I'm like, I don't know how they get away with, you know, and I even go to God like, God, why you let them get away with that? If I were to do that, you'd have killed me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you, you would come for me. Why, why would you let? And then of course the scripture says the Lord, those who love the Lord chase and, and, and all that, you know, and I get it. Um, but I believe also that there are those who God holds, um, responsible, you know, to whom much is given, much is required. And um, and I know that God has given me a lot. And, and that's why, you know, one of my tasks have been to balance my time. You when you have a lot like Jesus, when you have, you know, when you know you've got purpose and you've got a, a certain period of time to do it. Not that I'm checking out a life. Now, come on here. I'm just saying when you know you've got seasons, you know, your seasons, you know what you're supposed to be touching and handling. And you know what you're not what you're supposed to refrain from. And so I've had to learn that. And I believe that when you're a person that has time constraints for certain things and, and, and you, you end up doing something crazy, <laughs> I, b- I believe God deals swiftly and, and firmly with that. I mean, at least that's been my testimony. I don't know. I mean, y'all holler at me. You know, am I the only one? But he deals with me swiftly and firmly. And so that in and of itself has taught me to walk soft. I just don't, you know, there was one, I backslid on, in, in, um, uh, well, let's see, in August, I mean, I've been raised, you know, my father is an apostle. So, I mean, I've been raised in church all my life since eight years old when he established his church. Um, I was baptized at five in my grandfather's Baptist church. So, I mean, I've been in church. All I know is church. <laughs> um, but, you know, in terms, and, you know, I, I was called and I've always been a prophet. I mean, I have been seeing dreams and visions since I was a kid. So this is nothing new to me. And I thank God for it. I've been a student of the word since I was 13 and started in Revelation. God planted me and I, I, I cut my teeth in the word, in the book of Revelation, the hardest, one of the hardest books in the Bible. And people don't even preach on Revelation. But that's where God started me in Revelation. And then he took me to Psalms. Um, so this thing is not new to me. And I know too much. I don't know everything, but I know too much to play. You know what I'm saying? I know better. And so, you know, when I when I dedicated my life to God for real, for real, not being a church kid, but I mean, I said, okay, God, you know what? You've been calling me, pulling me, pulling me, pulling me. I'm going to give myself to you. I was 19 years old. And um, let me tell you something. I backslid 
my God, I backslid on God. And um, I was pregnant with my oldest daughter at the time. And I nearly lost my life. I was hospitalized for two months. I was in the hospital for so long, people of God. I had to check myself out to go get my hair done. I had to sign waivers that I would come back. And, you know, if anything happened, I would be, you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't hold uh, the hospital liable. I mean, it was that bad. I had to check myself out to get my hair done and, and, you know, take care of things or what have you. Two months in the hospital. And, you know, as I was giving birth, the doctors told me, they said there's, a, you know, a uh, um, risk of you passing away in, in childbirth. That was during the time I backslid. So when God finally allowed me to come back, because I'm crying out to God and God would not hear me. God would not hear me. Um, but, you know, thank God I made it through the pregnancy and so forth. But it took two years for God to open the door and let me back in. Two years. It was May 1995, and I often say that's my spiritual birthday, when the Lord let me back in. And let me tell you something. I've been running for Jesus ever since because you, I'm one of those kids. I'm one of God's kids. You don't have to, you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I've made many mistakes since then. I have. And even then, I, got, I mean, I would suffer, really, really suffer, even to some things recently that I got myself involved in. God was not nowhere in the building. God wasn't even on the street. And I got myself involved in it and I paid for it. God, and I said, God, you know, there's a scripture to say, you know, the Lord, you will, God, you will be buffeted for your own faults. You know, sometimes, you know, you think you're going to get in your stuff and God will just bring you. And I don't know who this is for because I'm supposed to be talking about dream interpretation, but somebody's pulling me in the Holy Ghost and I'm, uh, here it is. <laughs> God bless you. I'm bringing it right to you. But, you know, there are things when you, that you are buffeted for your own faults. The Bible said, take it patiently, old vessel of wrath. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you would cry and cry, God, help me, let me out, let me out. Jonah cried in the belly of the whale, help me. But it was until he came to himself. Like, you know what, God, okay, it's me. Like David, I gave you a few days ago, it's me, God. So when the Lord opened the door and let me back in, I ran for him. And yeah, I still did some dumb stuff even in that. And um, I don't get away. With, you know, he doesn't let me get away with my stuff. You know? And so... I said all that to say this, when you see a lot of things happening, uh, you know, in, in, in the church, okay, in the body of Christ, uh, it, it causes me great alarm. But as a young pastor, I made a lot of mistakes and I would put people in positions and do things, um, you know, for the sake of keeping people, for the sake of having somebody in this position, for the sake of having a particular ministry. And I mean, you got to be careful about that. I'm sharing with you my testimony um, that you may not, your ministry may not be graced for a women's ministry or a man's ministry or a couple, you know what I'm saying? So, and I often tell um, some of the ment uh, leaders that I mentor that, you know, don't look at what another ministry is doing and cookie cut it because your ministry may, may not be graced for that. I was talking to one leader <laughs> a couple of months ago and, um, and I was telling them, I said, you know, if you know that you have, your church has a stronghold because every church has a, some stronghold they're battling with. There are some churches that are strong in the prophetic, but they're also strong in gossip. I know a church right now strong in prayer. Man, they, you talking about move mountains and cast it into the sea? They will pray you up a wall and down, down the other side. But they also have a stronghold of gossip. So I'm like, how can you do that with, you know, but anyway. Um, so every church has, you know, the graces, but they also have their struggle. Okay, look at the church of Corinth. They had the graces. You, you, these, these were the prophets. But they also had people committing incest. You know, they also had women who were out of order. You know, so, you know, every church has its strength. And that's why you hear people, you know, all the churches mess up. No, it's, you know, it's just people. It's people trying to be perfected. And ministry is messy. If you get into ministry uh, thinking you're going to be rich, honey, praise God. Don't, don't quit your day job. I'm telling you. <laughs> um so, and you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit is moved, pulling me all over the place right now. Uh, but that's what I did. Um, I, I, I set up different um, teams and things in place. And, and, and let me tell you, I had to go to God and say, Father, I repent. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't take time to fully examine that person's spirit. I didn't take time to seek you. I didn't. I just did it out of my own presumptuousness. And the Lord said, you know what? That person is going to stay in position and torment you until you learn. And by God's grace, uh, God broke it up. Thank you, Jesus. So now I take my time. I've learned patience. 
I learned to wait on God. And there's some people, I have one a member, bless her heart, and I love her in Christ Jesus still. But she said, you know, well, I'm, I'm leaving because I didn't get ordained. And I said, well, I'm so sorry. God did not, he didn't, you know, he didn't speak to me um, about that. I'm not saying she wasn't called. I'm just saying as a leader, God hadn't spoken to me about it. And because I've learned from going ahead of God and doing what the people wanted years ago. And I don't play that stuff now. Come on now. Um, but I, I, I move slow. I move slow. But I was talking to that. I want to um, give you this point. And I got some scripture for you guys. Hang on. Um, but I was talking to this leader. Uh, and I was just telling her about, you know, just, you know, make sure you don't copycat what you see happening in another person's ministry. And um, I said, for example, if you, your church has a stronghold of lust, um, has a stronghold of promiscuity, uh, then, you know, you may not want to incorporate liturgical dance right now. You know, if your young people aren't sanctified. I had a conversation just recently. If your people, if they aren't, if they aren't sanctified, you know, then their moves won't be sanctified. And so you want to be very careful about it. And I was sharing it um, with this leader. I said, so, you know, you, you've got, and I, <laughs> this is based on experience. We had years ago in 2009 or 2008, we had this young lady in my church and she had a spirit of Herodias. And she would get up and dance, but it was not the dance of the Lord. It was not the dance after the order of Miriam, right? The dancing women and the women. It wasn't that. This was a spirit of Herodias. And if you know anything about Herodias, Herodias had a very sensual um, dance. And it was not to glorify God, but it was to incite lust and, and um, you know, sensu- sensuality. Okay. So again, you know, wisdom and experience um, has taught me a lot of things, and, and being chastised has taught you. The Bible said Jesus learned a thing, um, learn obedience by the things he suffered. And you, and I'm not saying he sinned. I'm just saying his suffering taught him obedience. And I'm saying likewise, my suffering, in that by virtue of my disobedience, taught me a lot of things. Okay, um, so just being careful. I, I don't know who that was for. Because it has nothing to do with dream interpretation. So praise God. Uh, Someone needed to hear that who's listening to this particular broadcast. You needed to hear that. And let me just say to you, if you are part of the laity, the membership, and there are certain ministries that you want to be a part of your church, um, you know, and and maybe your leader is saying not right now or no or whatever, um, you know, don't don't run to the conclusion of, oh, they're shutting me down and they don't like me. You know, try, you know, go back to God and ask the Father. If you don't have an understanding, go and ask the Lord why. Because that leader may, you know, they know their people. They know every shepherd knows their flock. And there's some ministries that can't handle certain types of, of auxiliaries. You know what I'm saying? You know, everybody can't have a T.D. Jakes ministry where you've got campuses. Everybody's not, you know, you have to know your grace. There are captains over 100, captains over 10, you know, captains over 50. So you've got to know what your captain of, know where your grace is. And so you can't cut, cut, uh, cookie cut what everybody else is doing. You're not grace for that. You start a dance ministry in your church and you've got people who are dealing with lust and they're dealing with, uh, you know, they got clubbing spirits. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you want to release something in your house and you're going to wonder why it's hard to get the spirit of God to move. You're going to wonder why deliverance is not breaking out. You're going to wonder why you don't see miracle signs and one signs and wonders is because you got some strange fire. OK, you got some strange fire. And so I just challenge you, <clears throat> those of you in the membership to pray for your leaders. Leading ministry is not easy. Because right now we're dealing, we're in a, we're in, and I was, um, oh, hallelujah, Jesus. We're in a season of, um, the apostasy, the great falling away. And so with that, a lot of leaders are, um, and I, again, this is all going back to the stream. Remember what I said, um, in, in, in my beginning, that I don't believe that God was just speaking to her individually. I believe this had a corporate connotation to it as well. And so this is kind of my heart. I'm sharing with you some leadership things that may factor into why um, that leader walked away. So, you know, we're in this falling away now. And, and I, I see a lot of leaders who are being very creative trying to keep people. You can't keep people that were never called to serve. You can't get when Listen, Jesus knew 
You know, he knew, he said, you know, I know those who are mine. He prayed, I think, in John chapter 16 or 17, when he prayed the intercessory prayer, the high priestly intercessory prayer. He said, Father, I know those who are mine. And I know those who are not. I know those. You know, so a leader knows. I, I know I do. I know when a person walk through, walks through the door, whether that's my sheep. I know them. I know them. I know their smell. I, I know their walk. That's the grace of a leader. And I don't mean to turn this into a leadership uh, thing, but it, again, her dream was so powerful. Her dream was so powerful. Um, as a le- So again, it's more than, oh, God called me to pastor. Oh, God, call-. you better wait on your ministry and make sure that God called you. Because you as a pastor, whatever your ranking of pastor, pastoring is, you are going to be held responsible for every soul on, on your, on your, under your covering. Every soul who's listed on your membership roster. And not only that, even the ones who come and sit in your house. You're responsible. If you give them a tainted word, if you give them a, a contaminated word, and that sheep consumes that word, and it causes them to stumble, causes them to error, you will be held responsible. My God, you will be beat with many stripes, and the blood of that sheep will be on your hands. So I'm not one of those that pull people out of their church. Oh, the Lord told me to come to you for you to come join my church. The Lord told me I'm supposed to be your spiritual mother. No, ma'am. <laughs> you never hear that from me. Matter of fact, some people will tell you I run from them. I do. Because I'm not, I, I'm telling you, you will learn. Suffering will teach you. If you, if God didn't put us together, listen. For what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And what God hasn't joined together, I will put asunder. Because it's gonna, it's gonna bring a, a, a weight to you, cause you're not graced for that relationship. You're just not great. There's some leaders not graced for it. They're just not graced. So you as a leader, you have to, it's not about branding and marketing and all this nonsense stuff that we see today that has nothing to do with the salvation of God's people. It has nothing to do with the gospel. Nothing. It's about make my name great and I'm this and I'm that. And let me tell you something. It's idolatry. Be careful, people of God. Be careful that, you know, uh, Herod did that. I think this was Herod, um, the Tetrarch. He did that. He lifted himself up. The people said, oh, he's like a God. And he accepted. You've got to be careful about accepting the praises that belongs to God. Do not steal his glory. Do you hear what I'm saying? I don't care how well you preach. I don't care how many books you've written. I don't care how well you sing. I don't care how well you dance. I feel the presence of God. Don't ever take God's glory. He said, I will not share my glory with no man. Even Jesus gave God his glory. Father, glorify me that I may glorify you. Come on, somebody. So Herod did that. He sat out there at that stadium where the Romans were torturing, amen, the people of God, the Christians or what have you. And let me tell you something. He took that glory. He stole God's glory and God killed him right there on the spot. The Bible said the worms, I don't know if it was some gastrointestinal whatever, if he got eaten by parasites, I don't know the scientific, biological thing behind it. All I know, he got eaten alive from the inside out. Worms, the Bible said, ate his body. I don't want those problems. I don't know about nobody else. So when we look at some of the reasons why, this woman of God said, this prophet said that the bus, the, the, the leader got up off the bus, a moving bus, and left the people of God. And the leader put the bus on cruise control. In other words, this leader wasn't even concerned about the growth. You know, you know what cruise control is. It means I'm just cruising. <laughs> it is, it's, it is what it says. I'm controlling the cruise. I'm controlling the speed. And they jumped ship. Jeremiah chapter 23. I told you guys I'll give you scripture. Jeremiah chapter 23, <clears throat> verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. You have scattered my flock 
and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, says the Lord. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries whither I have, whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their fold. And this is for the sheep that say, you know, God, you know, he, I, I'm in the wilderness. No, you are supposed to, you belong to a, if you are a sheep now, if you're a goat, you do what you want to do. You can wander as long as you want to wander. But if you are a sheep, you belong to a flock and the flock belongs to a fold. That's the word of God. You, you know, fight with God on that. Fight with God. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the word. He said, I will return them, bring them again to their fold, and there they shall be fruitful and increase. And some of the reasons why people are not seeing fruitfulness and increase, are you in place? Bottom line, are you in place? Okay? Um, and I will set up shepherds, listen to what the Bible says, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall be they excuse me, neither shall they be lacking, says the Lord. All right. And of course Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, we're the under shepherds. You know, we get it twisted. We're the under shepherds. <clears throat> Jesus Christ is all of our shepherds. We're all of his sheep. Um so that's Jeremiah chapter 23. And so you see how God, do you see how God feels about that? Do you see how God feels about that? And so a lot of the warfare um, that comes against pastors, especially, and I, I can talk about this being a pastor of a small, small ministry in terms of size. Now, when on, on the scale of the kingdom and, and momentum and influence, it's mega. Okay? But in terms of size, I have a small membership. And I'm cool with that. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I love it. I know my people. I know the names of every individual in my church. I know the babies in my church. They come, they hug me, eat my candy, praise God, sit on me in my husband's lap. Love it. I love it. I know my people smell. I know the ones who, who are struggling. I know the ones that's operating in, 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 you know, praise God. <laughs> I know when they manifest. And they know that I know when they manifest. And we have a beautiful relationship. I love every last one of them. And the ones that I know that the ones that kind of got in and I embrace them anyway, because you can't never turn nobody away. But, you know, they you just have to know, again, as a leader, those who are not called to you will still become a part of your a part of your flock, even if it's just for a season. And you have to know that you have to know the ones that are just there for a season and the ones who are there who are called to be a part of your flock. You have to know that. And that will help you leaders specifically from fighting against folk when they leave. When you know the ones, Jesus, listen, Jesus never fought Judas. I want you to look for, for, you know, for a minute. Look at the conversation Jesus had with Judas and then look at the conversation Jesus had with Peter. Jesus told Peter, Satan is out of, he said, uh, um, uh, Peter, he said, Satan is out of sift you as wheat, right? He said, but I pray for you that when you are converted, you'll strengthen the brothers. So Jesus foreknew that of Peter's denial. He said, you're going to betray me three times before the cock crow thrice. You betray me. Jesus saw that. Now, don't tell me. Jesus d saw Judas betray and didn't see Peter's. And as a leader, leaders, you will know God will reveal it to you. Which one of the sheep will betray you? He will. And again, it will be part of that, which you will have to keep in your inner man. You got to hold it. You got to love them. You can, Jesus, boy, this is a leadership thing right here. I hear you, God. You can, you're not allowed to mistreat them. I don't care what God shows you. It does not give you a license to beat them, to harass them, to preach your messages. Again. Don't you do that. That's still God's sheep. That's still God's sheep. Do not mistreat them. Jesus never mistreated Judas, even Judas, even though he knew what that man was. He said, I knew you was full of it. You know, uh, uh, you know, I knew you were, basically. You know. When I called you, I knew that you was a devil. I, I'm just saying, there'll be some folk that come in and they don't come for the right word, reason. You still, you're not allowed to mistreat them. You be firm, you flow in what God tells you, but you let God be God. Not being Lord over God's heritage. They're God's, remember we're under shepherds. They're God's sheep, all of us are. So, you look at the way Jesus interacted with Peter, 
when he announced Peter's betrayal. And then look at how Jesus interacted with Judas when he announced Judas's betrayal. He didn't tell Judas, I'm going to pray for you so you can come back and get things right. He was like, no, whatever you do, do quickly. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Do you see the dynamics in that? Jesus knew Judas was, <clears throat> excuse me, was up to no good. Judas, his, his, his season of service, however that was, ended. There was no need to pray for restoration over that. There was no need to pray that you would come back. There's no need to, there's some people to stop praying. It's, it's done. It's sealed. And, and from, in the archives of heaven, it's been sealed before you was born. It's done. It's finished. D -d -d Enjoy the good times. Look at your pictures and your videos, but it's over. It's over. Whereas in Peter's case, you know, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. And what happened next chapter two? Peter stood up. Men, uh, these men are not drunk as you suppose, you know, for it, it is the third hour of the day. You know what I'm saying? On the day of Pentecost, the betrayed, the, the betrayer preached the message of Jesus Christ and over 3,000 souls were saved and added to the kingdom. Do you see the difference? So, you know, that's why it's good to know the word of God so that you don't, you know, act out in the flesh and, and, and you know, get yourself in trouble. Trust me, I've been there. You don't want that. Okay, so, you know, and again, just looking at some of the reasons why um, this bus driver abandoned the bus and left the people. But this woman of God was in place. And I'm going to go now to Joshua chapter one, verse two. Joshua chapter one, verse two. Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise you and all these people and cross over to Jordan into the land I'm giving the children of Israel. And I just pulled that out of context again, um, because in terms of that person in leadership, you know, that their season ended. They abandoned the work of God. They abandoned the people of God and even placed them in danger. Remember what we said in Jeremiah? You know, they were in a place of fear, a place of lack. And, and so the danger for that leader was they abandoned the, the, the people. But God, because listen, he said, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. God had someone else there. And that's what I was telling the woman of God. You were in position. And there'll be, in some cases, God will have you. In some cases, don't go connect with leaders so you can take over. That's the wrong spirit. Don't, you know, <laughs> don't do that. I'm just saying, some of you may wonder why you feel drawn to a certain leader or you know what I'm saying you feel like you're covering them in a city or whatever whatever you know what I'm saying you're serving as an adjutant or whatever your thing is and um, it can be not always the case as my apostle says but it can be that God is positioning you for you know for whatever okay I'm not trying to put no wild ideas into anybody's head but I'm just saying there will be time times where um, hold on, my microphone is uh, where you're being positioned for something that's getting ready to come, and you don't even know why. Joshua didn't know why he was following Moses around, why he was Moses' minister, why he was Moses' armor bearer. All he knew was, just, I just need to be, you will feel a drive to be in place. You don't know why. Everybody else taking a week off, taking a month off, and you just always there. And to you, you just, you know, I, I don't know why I'm. I'm, I don't know why I'm always following the leader around. I don't know why. It can be because of what God is preparing you for. And let me tell you something. Uh, there's a blessing in being that person that goes to rescue God's people. You look through the Old Testament. God always loved on his warriors, those who are going to fight the battles of the Lord. Jehovah Nisi, the, you know, the Lord, our banner, we fight under his banner because every every battalion, right? My husband served in the army. Every battalion has their own flag, their own symbol, their own name. And so we fight under the banner that, you know, the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies. So God always loved on his warriors always loved on his warriors because they would always protect and fight for the people of God. So there's a blessing. That's why Joshua's life was so blessed. God prolonged his life. Why? Because he was in position. And I'm telling you, there can be a strong urge to abandon ship when the leader abandons ship. You know? There can be a, you know, Moses is dead. The people all despondent. They were stuck in grief. And God was like, no, 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 rise up. You, you got what it takes. And sometimes you don't know what you have in you until the occasion calls for it. I'm a witness. You will think, well, God, I don't know if I can do this by myself. I don't know if I can do this in this season. I don't know. Yes, you can. 
Yes, you can. You've been like God, uh, um, Mordecai told Esther, you will call for such a time as this. You think God brought you to the kingdom and into the house of Ahasuerus to be a beautiful queen of Persia? And I said, no, you're here to save God's people. So understand that there's more to your calling than what meets the eye. And right now, it may just seem like you're just sweeping the floor. You're just opening the door. You're just collecting fans at the church. And, and you know, it just seemed like a mundane thing. But don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate the greatness. Don't underestimate what God is teaching you, what God is building in you in that season. One more scripture, and I'm going to let you go. This is in Acts chapter 1. And let's see. I'm going to begin reading at verse 21, Acts chapter 1, verse 21. And this is um, in terms of when the leader abandoned their post, uh, how it, that spot needed to be filled. And I even I practice that at my church. Um, when someone leaves or is you know, unable to fill their role, I always say, hey, we got to fill this. You know, you don't have gaps and leaks. That, you know, the Bible says gives no place, give no place to the enemy. There should be no no gaps. <laughs> Amen. Somebody has to make up the hedge. The Bible said when a hedge is broken, the serpent will bite. The hedge represents the covering. And if God said, I want 12 apostles and one has defected, then there needs to be another apostle. Somebody's got to fill that spot. Look at what happens in Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. And they appointed two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, which knoweth the hearts of all men, Show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. I feel like I need to read that again and just place some emphasis there. Because you will find, and I've heard it said in a lot of circles, oh, I can't believe they, you know, they feel that position so fast. So I can't believe, um, whatever they can't believe. I don't know what people can't believe, but all I know is what the scriptures say. And as a leader, you got to know, you know, that when, uh, uh, as the Lord revealed to the woman of God in the dream, that position had to be filled immediately. She saw curves, right? You know, as if those of you who are licensed drivers, you can't use, not always the case, use cruise control on a curve. Especially if you're in Kentucky or Tennessee where those mountains are. Give me a break. You don't use cruise control on a mountain. You don't use cruise control on a curve. So again, that leader placed the people of God in danger. But thank God she was sitting right behind the leader to get into the driver's seat, even though she was afraid. But she, it, God had already placed in her what she needed to get the people to the place of safety. And and she said in the dream, there was no crash. She got them where they needed to go. So that void had to be filled. And this is how a lot of wolves uh, come in, right? Paul said it, Jesus said it after my departure, wolves would come in. Why? Because his place had not been cut. No one had, his place had not been replaced. They had bishops set up all the place, but there weren't apostles set up in, in, in all the churches. So a lot of, you know, gainsayers came in and, and, and came in with other damnable doctrines and heresies and things and, you know, persuading people against the gospel. So you've got to have key people in place. And so that's why I want to read this to you again, because I want you to understand the heart of the men that they had to choose between. And then the one that was chosen. It's very important. Your heart. Some of the reasons, and, and I say this to you in love. In love, I say it to you in love. Some of the reasons why we, let me just include myself, have not been chosen for certain positions is because we don't have the heart of the leader. 
we don't have the heart of the leader. David had a heart for Saul, even though Saul mistreated him, even though Saul uh, threatened to assassinate him. David yet maintained a heart for Saul. At the very end, David cried. He wept. The people had to pick him up off the ground and say, man, come on. We got to get to Jerusalem. We got to coronate you and make you uh, crown you and make you king. Even after he became king, he said, who is left of Saul's house that I may show kindness to? Do you understand the heart, people of God? Not, oh, I'm glad he's gone. I'm going to kick him out, kick all his kids out and so on and so Even when Shimei came against him, Shimei was Saul's one of Saul's somebody I don't know if he was a grandson or one of Saul's servants I'm not sure who Shimei was um S-H-I-M-E-I and and Shimei came against David called David a dog now listen here <laughs> you know you don't call the king much less David David is a man of war you don't come at him like that ask Nabal about that problem you have to be careful there's oh God, there's even an honor and that's a whole other topic but honor your leaders praise God let me just move out of that one but even when, when Shimei came against David, the men were saying to David, you need to kill him. Don't let him talk to you like that. You're the king. David wouldn't touch him. He, would, he said, I understand how he feels. I understand where he's, he's hurt. He blames me for Saul's demise. Okay? So let me get into Acts chapter 121 because I've to. i I've got to go. Wherefore are uh, these men uh, which have companied with us. Let me read this again because I want to emphasize some things. Wherefore of these men which have companied with us. So these were men who were with them. They have companied with us. Listen, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So you've got the Jesus had, and I often say with leaders, you've got, you've got those who are your inner circle. And people call them cliques. And you, you know what? It is what it is. But the Bible tells us Jesus had three. Jesus had 12. Jesus had 50. And Jesus had the multitudes. So if you want to, you know, call it a click, you know, I guess maybe that's a click. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus knew who could be a part of his inner circle. You, you can't have the multitudes in your inner circle. They don't, they, praise God. I got to get, that'll take me somewhere. So I don't have time to get into that right now, Jesus. Wherefore are these men which have companied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out and went in and out among us. So uh, 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 Matthias and Justice were a part of that company. I don't know if they were part of the 50 or the 500. But they, they weren't part of the three or the twelve, I'll tell you that. But they were in the midst. And Luke, which he's the author of, of um, uh, Acts, he said they were with us all the time. They saw Jesus in and out. So they were familiar with Jesus' heart for ministry, work of ministry. He, they said, listen, and they tell you how long he'd been there. Listen to the Holy, listen to the word of God. They said, beginning from the baptism of John, when Jesus was baptized, these two were there. So does God honor establishment and loyalty and faithfulness? You better believe he does. Yes, he does. He said they were there from the beginning of the baptism of John until the same day he was taken up. In other words, these brothers were there from the time. They were there from the time Jesus was baptized to the time Jesus departed this earthly realm. They said, must one be ordained to be witness? So in other words, they said, whoever is, is, is going to be a part of this, whoever's going to take Judah's place, they have to be a witness of this. We don't want somebody that heard about it. No, you got you to, you must have an experience. And that's why I believe the woman of God had to, it was seated right behind the leader because there's an experience that you must have. Okay. And experience come from, comes from service. And they appointed two, only found two. They only found two. Out of the multitudes, you know what I says a lot. They appointed to Joseph and Matthias. And even in that, because listen, here, this is so powerful. Even though they found two, they said we can only have one because why? Jesus said 12. I send you out two by two. He did So if you got 13, somebody's going to be off. And God has got an order. I'm sending you out two by two. He said, God, Jesus called you 12. One of you is a devil. We're going to keep this 12. We're going to listen. We're going to, we're going to keep the same parameters, the same guidelines of ministry that Jesus outlined. We're going to, we're not going to change it. We're not going to deviate from it. And whoever's coming into it must have the same experience, the same heart, the same mind, the same testimony. That's so powerful. That's so powerful. 
So they found two. But they said, okay, we found two, but we can only choose one. And they said, okay, so now we've got to pray. And they prayed. And they said, Lord, you know the hearts of all men. You know which of these two you have chosen. That he can take this part of the ministry and the apostleship. Not just a ministry, but this man is going to become an apostle. This is for those who say, you know, in order to be an apostle, you have to, you know, walk with Jesus, be with Jesus. This, this, this man was not a part of the original 12. He was there around the circumference of Jesus' ministry, but he wasn't that part of the inner circle. But he was grafted in. Uh, that he may take, verse 25, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell. That he may go to his own place. And they gave, cast forth their lots. And the lot chose Matthias. And Matthias was numbered with the 11. And it made up the 12. Okay. So I'm that's that I'm coming to a close. I've said a lot. Went a lot of places. <laughs> in in the realm of the spirit. Um, shared a lot of things. And um, God is going to have his way in this word. God is going to have his way um, in you through this word. Uh, continue to press forth into your dreams. Um, certainly, if you have some dreams that you, you know, want me to, uh, you know, pray over and, and offer you what I feel God is saying. Again, I'm not the authoritative figure. God is. And I can be wrong. Um, but I'd love to help if, if you, you know, desire me to do so. Um, my email is delisafields at yahoo.com. That's just my first and last name at yahoo.com. Very simple. Um, or my website. We actually have the Dream Center or the Dream Team. Is on my website, and you can go there and submit your dreams, and that's www.tlcor.org, www.tlcor.org. That's the Love Church of Charlotte, um, if you just want to put that into your browser and, and Google search it. Uh, but, yeah, send your dreams, and we'd love to um, just pray over it. Uh, we have a few other members who are also gifted um, in dream interpretation. God has used me to train them and raise them, and sometimes when I'm stuck, I'll just say, hey, help me out. You know, what are you, what are you feeling? What do you see? And they can um, sometimes be um, a good set of, sec- a second set of eyes to see, you know, some things that I've missed. Um, so, yeah. So we, we give God glory for the woman of God and for her sharing. And I did ask her, I said, I need, I said, I feel like God wants me to share this. Um, I said, there's so much to it. And I don't believe it's just a personal um, uh, interpretation. I believe there's something corporate we can extract from it. And she gave me her permission. I won't call her name out, but um, we certainly thank God for her. And we pray for her. We pray for her ministry. Our ministry, we pray for her leader. Um, if that's what God is saying. Um, you know, we just pray that uh, if they're uh, considering abandoning the ship, that, um, that they would not. That God would just um, bind their feet to the work. Um, but if it's their time to leave. Because sometimes people, listen, I found out some people. <clears throat> don't know how to leave you know i often say in my church i said you know when you leave don't slam the door <laughs> you know don't slam the door or don't burn the house down you know have enough cause if, if your season is over and i i get it seasons change if your season has ended at least be considerate for those whose seasons have not you know shut the door gently <laughs> don't make no noise as you walk out because there are still people that God is dealing with and he's growing and he's maturing in that leadership, in that ministry, what have you. So just because it doesn't work for you anymore, that's you. Don't go, don't burn the house down and I'm, I'm going to shut the church out. I'm going to do, but now you're operating in an antichrist spirit. The Bible said, you know, the Bible said, how can a house divided against itself stand? How can two walk together except they agree? You know, there'll be times you have to separate and walk away. Paul and, and Barnabas had, the Bible says swift contention, sharp contention between the two of them. And they walked away. Barnabas took John Mark and Paul took Silas. And that was that. They didn't try to tear one another down. That's not fruit of God's spirit. And there are some people who are so bitter that, you know, they, they just, they, I just pray for them right now. We talked about the root of bitterness. If you know somebody like that, would you please share that message with them so that they can get healed? And that they can understand that Jesus Christ died for the church, whether you like what's happening inside the four walls of it or not. You know, have you prayed? Have you fasted? Have you supported? Have you suggested anything? Or do you just talk? You know what I'm saying? 
So we have a responsibility to, to support. If we don't understand something, God gives understanding. He gives wisdom to those who don't have it liberally. Lord, I don't understand what's happening right now in my church. I don't know why my leader is doing that. I don't know why this one is taking that person's place. It's just been gone a week and now something I don't understand. Well, ask God. Go to the scriptures. God will show you. There's nothing secret that shall not be revealed. There's nothing secret in the kingdom. There's some things that maybe you just, God is not giving you access to. You're not in that three. You're in the 12 or the 50 or the 500. You know what I'm saying? So know your place. Because there's some things that you don't need to know. You don't have the capacity to, to deal with that. It will cause you to stumble. Some things you find out about people will cause you to look at them and mistreat them. So God won't reveal that to you. Okay? So we love you in Christ Jesus. I pray the message bless you. Um, share um, with someone. Share with the leader. Okay? Do this. Share with the leader who you know is struggling with closing their doors. And this is not about judging any church leader. That I'm, listen, I'm not no judge. And that's a double negative, but I'm just, I'm not a judge. Um, I, you know, to each his own. I just pray for encouragement. Some leaders don't have a choice. If they don't have the money, what else, what are they supposed to do? You know? Um, so, but some of them, you know, couldn't have their way and walked away and left the bus running with people on it. So we just want to um, encourage the body of Christ, encourage those who are serving in leadership. Um, it's not easy, I'm telling you. 15 years of pastoring and I'm still a young pastor I still say I'm still learning I'm so much to learn so many mistakes I've made uh, but I thank God for the journey so you all be blessed I thank God for you uh, welcome your comments welcome um, you sharing um, help somebody amen God bless you